Hello and welcome. I'm Jorge Rojas, Director of Learning and Engagement at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's ACME session, Reflecting and Learning from the Artists of Pain and Possibility. I would like to start this session by acknowledging that we are on the ancestral and unceded lands of Native American people. It is our responsibility to acknowledge the significance of place and the continued existence and contributions of indigenous people who have lived on and cared for this land for thousands of years. We encourage everyone to join in a commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. ACME stands for Art, Community, Museum, Education, and is a UMFA initiative dedicated to rethinking the public role of the museum. ACME sessions are a series of public meetups where participants can imagine and articulate new models of education and community engagement through dialogue. Normally, bi-monthly sessions are held at Salt Lake City Public Library branches, but due to challenges presented by COVID-19, we are experimenting with new ways, like tonight's Zoom, to continue our goal of bringing together Salt Lake City's most creative, inventive, and cross-disciplinary minds to explore relevant topics and issues within society. For tonight's session, the UMFA has brought together artists and organizers from the public art series, public art series, Pain and Possibility, to reflect, engage, and further this important conversation around the healing power of public art, and to ask the question, what's next? Artists and cultural workers play critical roles during these moments of unrest, uncertainty, and revolution. Thank you for joining us for an evening of reflection, dialogue, and learning around the artist's work and experiences. The UMFA would like to thank our community partners, the Salt Lake City Public Library, Sugar Space Arts Warehouse, and Mestizo Institute of Culture and Arts, Mika, for making this ACME session possible. We also wanna thank ZAP, Zoo Arts and Parks, and Salt Lake City Arts Council for funding the Pain and Possibility Project and for their support. A special thanks to Brittany Reese, director and founder of Sugar Space Arts Warehouse, and to Paul Kuttner, associate director at University Neighborhood Partners and Mika Board Vice Chair, for leading the Pain and Possibility Project and for fac facilitating this evening's session. And a, very and a very special thank you to the artists from Pain and Possibility who we'll be hearing from tonight. I also wanna give a shout out to my awesome colleague, Maggie Trilly, UMFA coordinator of adult and university programs for coordinating this event. Uh, just a couple of uh, things to note, we'll be saying, sending out a quick survey next week to everyone that has registered for your feedback. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you send us your feedback, you'll be, uh, we'll put your name in a hat uh, to get some free passes for, uh, uh, to come to the museum. If you're interested in staying up to date on future ACME, UMFA, or library programming, let us know in the survey. Uh, one, uh, also, please note that tonight's session will be recorded and posted online in the coming weeks. Uh, later on, we're gonna be breaking, breaking out into groups. Uh, the final recording will not include our conversations in the breakout rooms, as we would like everyone to share openly and candidly. So thanks again for being part of the conversation. Um, one last thing, we just wanted to kind of give you a quick snapshot for how tonight's session will go. Um, we're going to we're going to start by screening a quick five minute video uh, that was created by that was uh, created by Josh Sampson uh, about the Pain and Possibility pro Project to give you a quick overview. Um, then Paul and Brittany will introduce the project and how it came to be. After that, Paul will lead a conversation with the artists. And we'll get to hear from the artists a little bit about their projects. Um, then we're going to move all participants into breakout rooms for community conversations. Um, our facilitators will be Paul, Brittany, and Dulce, uh, and and maybe myself too, um, if we have that many, if we have enough people. Um, so uh, following the breakouts, we'll end with the community shareback. Um, thanks again for being here, for being part of the conversation. We look forward to learning together with you. Now let's watch a quick five minute video about the Pain and Possibility Project. Following the video, we'll hear from Brittany and Paul Kuttner. Our 
art for me has always been a form of protest. It poses questions which I find are important for social change. I've always connected social movement, social justice with my artistic form of dance. We communicate in different ways as humans and I think art touches fibers that normally we can't touch verbally. You know, in like a protest, there's like the anger, which is important. Another emotion that is needed is like the, the hopefulness or the inspiration, you know, to think of a, of a different future. And so I think that's what art can do. The Salt Lake dance community is a really, really special place. We want to contribute to diversifying it and making it a more inclusive and equitable space for especially BIPOC artists, artists of color, and black artists, and queer LGBTQIA plus artists. A shedding is an opportunity for all of these dance artists to come together and share their personal experiences, their traumas, their joy, and share that experience with an audience in an outdoor, personal, homey setting where we can all come together and shed and create and mourn and laugh and cry, whatever. Due to COVID, I wanted to do something outside. I'm working on five different sculptures of workers slash laborers. They're going to be set up in different areas around the city. You know, I'm trying to make it for the community, you know, because I know in this area on the west side, there's a lot of people that can't work from home and more at risk. Yeah, so I want to speak to them. I want to speak for them and to them. A few months ago, we started a panel discussion through Zoom. It's called Capoeiristas for Black Lives Matter. We wanted to have that space to share our stories and just to have, get people to listen so that way they can educate themselves on like how they can be an ally or an advocate for justice and freedom during this, this really oppressing time. I've decided to put together a concept dance video, feature a group of women in my class that are making the space and leading direction in organizing the, the video here. I wanted to tell the story of a social or and political movement through embodying what that movement would look like through dance, through movement, through storytelling in a more humanistic way. I think a lot of people in my generation grew up having uncomfortable conversations that people maybe weren't used to having. For me, it's a lot of how I enter these types of conversations is through dance because I think dance is a good way to manifest whatever you're trying to um, feel and show. But a lot of people don't know what those emotions are. They don't know how their body reacts to the physical, to the mental, to the psychological toll that social movements, political movements take on the body. And I thought it would be a really good opportunity to visually show people, this is what you feel. This is how I feel. This is what you might be feeling. I have been going to the, some other protests about Black Lives Matter. And so uh, when uh, Kathy Trang, the other artist working on this, suggested uh, the project, I, I really got excited about the possibility of doing something about it that is uh, like artistic. So it's gonna be a traveling monument. So it's like an arch and uh, there's gonna be projections inside and then on both sides. So the idea is that people walk through it and it's like a ritual of committing to anti-racism. And so the title is like Tomorrow's Monument. So we were talking about like, what would it mean to, to make a monument that is about the future and not the past and uh, invite people to imagine a better future. We're going through difficult times globally and uh, what we want to do is we want to take this, the cultural patterns as a symbol for hope and to unite. The colors that we have here, it's to represent the different colors of humanity. All these colors, that they're part of one mural, you know, it's kind of united sometimes when it doesn't appear that we're getting along or there's a lot of conflict. Hope is really all we got and that keeps us moving and going. So we wanted to represent this uh, global hope. And that feeling of something better coming, right? Street art is like soul food, so you're feeding yourself when you're looking at this art. And once you start looking into deeper uh, details, you start to really understand the message or the idea.
Okay. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> okay, great. Um, sometimes my internet was a little on and off and I'm not seeing everybody on their pictures, but if you can hear me, that's great. Um, I'm so happy to be here to share with you and learn from you um, about this project and you know what's next going forward. I'll tell you a little bit about how this project came about. Sugar Space Foundation is a nonprofit 501c3 and we had um, some funding set aside for projects for this year. Um, and then COVID hit and um, uh, you know a lot of other things that happened in our communities and um, we realized that we needed to rethink our programming for the year and really wanted to create a place for the community to heal together, mourn together, engage with each other, um, and also just kind of explore this historical moment in time. And we also wanted to make sure this funding got into the hands of the artists um, and support artists and the important work that they do. So in reimagining how to reuse these funds, I reached out to Jorge Rojas and Paul Kuttner and Mika and um, some of the other organizations and artists in the community that um, to get some feedback about and put our heads together is to creating a platform to um, allow artists to express, you know, through art what's going on in our community right now. And so we put out, we, you know, played around with a lot of different ideas and came up with um, kind of an open-ended platform and did a call for artists to see what kind of projects people wanted to um, engage with the community. And um, basically this panel of artists selected um, the six projects that you will see today. And they're all very different, all very powerful. And I just feel, so um, happy that I was able to be a part of this and learn from everybody and experience um, you know, this time with, with you all. And I'm excited to see where this could go in the future. Um, and that is kind of how Pain and Possibility came about. So Paul, if you want to take it from there. Sure, thanks Brittany. Hi all, uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Paul Kuttner, um, pronouns he, him, his. I am here representing Mestizo Institute of Culture and Arts. And as Brittany says, she sort of brought the idea of doing something, social distance, something uh, that responded to the world around us instead of just trying to do what we always used to do um, in this new situation. And so I'm very honored to have been a part of Pain and Possibility and to be here on this call um, with all of the, the fabulous artists and other community members who, who've had a chance to join us. You know, the, for those of you who didn't um, get to see all of it, or uh, actually I'd be really curious if anyone's seen every single show um, at multiple sites, I would love to know what your thoughts are. But basically we, you know, we had a very fast timeline. These artists moved quickly. And when we finally launched, we, for about two weeks, we just kind of quietly took over spaces all over Salt Lake City. You know, we had, um, we had individual artists and teams and larger groups. We had uh, film showings and dance performances and sculpture and muralism. We had big public displays and we had small intimate events. Um, some of the spots around the city where this, uh, where these art pieces showed up included uh, uh, Sugar Space uh, Arts Warehouse, where this all started, but also the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art and Wasatch Community Gardens and First Unitarian Church and Finch Lane Gallery and just kind of somewhat quietly sort of sprung up. And that's, I think it was a beautiful way for this to happen. None of us knew what would, what would happen. We really didn't know how this would go. It was new for all of us. Um, and I'm really proud of what has come out of it. And I think, and I'm glad we're having this Acme session because I think, you know, each piece really all of these pieces really deserve a bit more digging into uh, a bit more understanding a chance to hear from the artists and also a chance to think about what we learned from this experience what we learned from these different projects and where that can go next so thank you all for joining us we are going to so for the next um Next little bit, we're going to hear directly from the artists. So it'll be a bit of a panel, kind of a Zoom panel presentation. We're fortunate to have 
one representative from each of the six projects with us tonight. Uh, as well as I think when I look at the participant list, it looks like some other artists from the projects have joined as well. We have the panel will be six people um, and they'll introduce themselves to you uh, in a moment. So what we're going to do to start is to ask um, each of the artists to uh, introduce themselves um, and their collaborators to introduce what their work was and describe their project briefly and then answer one question which is what did you learn or what were you surprised about in the process of carrying out this project so we're just going to say you know what's your name who are your collaborators what was your project and what did you learn or what new surprises came out of this process after each Artist has had a chance to answer that for two or three minutes. We're gonna we're gonna go come into the big group and we're gonna ask some questions of the whole panel. So we do have some questions prepared. However, it would be great to have your questions and know what all of you are really interested in hearing from uh, from the presenters. So if you could, if you if you can, access the chat um, anytime during this, you could throw out some questions you'd like to ask a specific artist or all of the artists, and we may not get we probably won't have a lot of time to get to all of them, but we'll kind of take a look and see if some big themes are emerging and, and use our time uh, for that. So with that said, I will pass off to our first artist, which is um, Kathy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to this ACME session. I am Kathy Tran. I go uh, by she, her, hers. Um, the art project I was part of is Tomorrow's Monument done with Alejandro Moya. Um, it was a 10 foot structure made of metal and fabric with uh, interactive projections. Um, this project was to kind of address uh, the current events that were happening with uh, monuments uh, that were being taken down all over the country. And we wanted, we wanted a monument to symbolize um, the hope of tomorrow instead of um, the, uh, what it usually represents, which is the past. Um, yeah, and what I learned personally from this was just like the sheer amount of fabric that it takes to build something of the scale and, you know, the, the human power that needs to go into even a monument that is just a 10 foot by like nine foot width. Um, so thinking about, you know, other monuments around the world and how massive they are and just all the work that it really takes to have them exist. Thank you. So I think, um, Renee. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm really um, grateful to be here. Thanks for, um, for hosting this talking session. So I'm representing um, uh, my group uh, from, from my Capoeira school, um, called Bota Muda. Um, our project, um, so the video organizers, um, I'll name them out. Um, first one, Carla Locatelli. Um, she goes by Manchinguera. Um, Mestri Jamaica, who is our teacher, our Capoeira teacher. Um, Allison Giletto, um, Alex Walburn, A.B. Lobos, Tatiana Canatieri and Dimitri Jackson. And our project um, is called Capoeiristas for Black Lives Matter. And it's a video project. It's a 10 minute um, short uh, concept dance video on racial oppression and how capoeira is a form of resistance. Um, how the art form, how the Afro-Brazilian um, art form is a form of resistance. And um, 
uh, what surprised me in this um, in uh, working in this project was the um, community collaboration and how much strength that was that came out of how much strength in um, in this bond that we created as a group. Um, I always felt that um, the feeling was there, but it was pretty amazing to see how much space that the that um, myself and the organizers could put together in a little bit of time uh, to put the, the video together. I mean, filming and um, editing and um, having uh, support from the, uh, the other students in our, in our class and um, as well as the, the kids energy, um, the kids uh, co uh, collective uh, efforts. So, so um, yeah, the point of our project was to bring um, all of us together and show everyone what capoeira is all about and what it can do for um, each other and um, and just as individuals um, uh, in this challenging time. So thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Miguel Galas. I am part of the Roots Art Collective and uh, as well with uh, Luis Novoa and Alan Ochoa. We are artists. We met um, over here. We all grew up on the west side and um, our art is deeply rooted in uh, doing murals along our community over here. And um, we were really excited for this project. Uh, we titled it A World, A World of Hope. And um, what we, the intention of our mural is to, to sort of um, reflect on, on, the, on the times and try to send a positive message of this um, global um, healing through the arts. And uh, part of the techniques that we utilize is we, uh, we use a lot of motifs in our in our art and uh they represent uh the different continents so each pattern has a is deeply connected to a region around the world and uh as well as the color palette that we that we used is uh to uh stand in solidarity with all the different social movements that are going on right now and um and yeah, some of the things that were really surprising is that uh, despite of, you know, regardless of the difficult times, we still had a lot of community uh, kind of come by and hunk or say something and telling us that they, how much they liked it. So we were really happy for that. You know, even though we all had a mask on and everything, it, they kind of, helped us push through the through the hot weather and to keep painting so we were really uh, we were really excited uh, from the response of, of the community and um, yes the the mural is located at the sugar space uh, facility on the yeah, there we go Brittany just typed it Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dominica Green or Dom. I use she, her, hers. Um, and want to say thank you uh, to Brittany and to all involved. And just um, thank you to the artist. It's amazing hearing about your work. Um, um, my, myself and my dear friend Courtney, who you're looking at uh, right here doing something incredible, created uh, a shedding. And this was um, a live in-person outdoor performance in the Glendale neighborhood. 
uh, Courtney and her partner uh, have a very large backyard, about 90 feet long, 50 feet wide. So we were able to um, build this stage um, and, and create a safe um, live performance for specifically um, BIPOC folks and people of color and LGBTQIA individuals uh, to come together um, and speak about our experiences. And more importantly, um, it was our hope to provide a platform where we could actually come together because we, found, we find that um, those platforms don't necessarily exist for, um, for us to safely um, share the work that we are creating uh, here in Utah. So um, it was really beautiful. And I would say um, what we learned from it was um, one of the things that we learned from it was that um, the community is actually really craving this um, and is really craving conversation, our community, um, to not only dance and share or move about our experiences, but to then talk about them after. Um, so, yeah. And these photos were taken by Tori Duhame. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks, uh, Mika and Sugar Space for the opportunity to uh, show with all these amazing artists. It's been really inspiring to see everyone's work. My name is Andrew. Um, I go by he, him pronouns. I was born and raised in Salt Lake. Um, my project worked is a commentary on essential versus non-essential workers. I typically am a drywall guy for my job. Um, and it, the question first came up when the pandemic hit, you know, when it first started, it was pretty scary, still is scary, but we were working at a job and at a very wealthy person's home and we brought up the fact that we might take a couple of weeks off when the city shut down and the owner of the home decided to say no um, because they wanted their bathroom done which was confusing to me because they had five other bathrooms that they could have been using oh, so it brought up the question of you know, essential for who? We have cashiers, we have, we have people in grocery stores, people that we, the society actually needs, but me remodeling someone's bathroom, I don't feel like is that essential. So the project is five different sculptures of workers. Um, it was set up in three different locations at Umoka, Wasatch Community Gardens, and Modern West Fine Art. Um, at the end of the week, a friend of mine, we went around the city and dropped them off at different locations to get more of a uh, gorilla type effect from it. We went through City Creek Mall with them. We went through Gateway, the DA's office, construction sites, just to kind of set them up. We just finished a video about it, so hopefully we'll be posting that soon. But... One thing I learned is that there's been a lot of people that are happy to support the arts. A lot of people are very eager when I made a call for locations. A lot of people are very eager to host the event. And it's also very easy to walk through City Creek Mall with a terrifying sculpture over your shoulders. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to show work with all these other amazing artists. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Dulce Horn um, and I'm representing Uprising. I worked on this project with Ashley Jackson, she, her, and Mikael Lawler, he, him. Um, this was 
identical based on political and social movements and political and social justice. We wanted to create the pathway, the arc, the story narrative of a movement. We did this by having six pieces, moment, anger, spark, exhausted, heal, and demand. Each one focused on a critical moment that we identified um, during a movement. Um, it was loosely based on the murder of George Floyd and the um, protest, the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter protest we saw during the summer. But we want this show, this piece, all of our pieces to be applied to whatever social political movement that you deem, um, deem it fitting. Um, this is a call for activists to be able to understand truly, like how, how am I feeling? How can I see this and see it reflected um, onto somebody else's body? One of the most surprising things that I've learned was exactly how messy my living room can get um, when I'm creating 15 million different protest signs um, for a one 20 minute show that was shown um, six times. It was truly remarkable how much red paint we went through, um, how many Sharpies I used, um, and how many protest poster boards we went through. Thank you. Thank you all. That was fabulous. Thank you for, for, for the summary and for sharing some of your thoughts and intentions behind this work, um, which is always, I think, enriching. Um, so, you know, as you all can see, this was really an amazingly diverse group of projects taking different angles and approaches engaging with different parts of our communities. Um, you know, I think there's just a lot of richness here in terms of the different roles that art plays in uh, in larger moments and and movements and in small more intimate ways in community. And I think there's a lot to dig into here. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll try to keep, keep a look on that. I'll start with a couple though, uh, just for everyone. So um, a couple of you touched on this briefly. Uh, Miguel, you mentioned a few people stopping by while you were painting it, but I'm really curious to hear from y'all. Like, what has the response been? What kind of responses or conversations or, um, or thoughts have you gotten from people who were who experienced the the projects that you did i know a couple of you actually had dialogues after events and so i think there was probably some really rich stuff there other people maybe you got kind of things in passing so i just love you know um to so just jump in um i don't think we'll call on people because i can't i'm on an ipad i can't even see everyone to sort of call so if you can just jump in and share kind of what have been some of the feedback and some of the thoughts and some of the, the discussions that this has led to for you I'll mention uh, when we, we were uh, filming, we ended up going to the police station and right across the street, there was a, um, a uh, development happening. And we saw a worker on the stairs, you know, he was wearing his orange vest and his hard hat. And we saw maybe we'll ask him if he wants to be part of a photo shoot. And when we started talking to him, he mentioned that he was just fired from the job, you know, so he got fired and went and sat on those stairs and we had a good long conversation with him. Um, it was a rough moment in his life. And he mentioned that he feels like this lifeless mannequin that he was sitting next to. And that broke my heart. But that was just one response that we got from it. And I'm thankful for that experience, as sad as it was, but it was interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, any other experiences? I know, I think Renee and Dominica, you both had uh, discussions with the audience after. I'm curious what you heard. Yeah, it was, um, yeah. Oh, go oh. ahead. Sorry, Renee. Um, I was going to say that, um, 
something that was remarkable was that it it was acknowledged uh, in the conversation post uh, shedding that um, lots of the things that we did see um, on stage, <clears throat> excuse me, really could not have been shared um, in within a normal proscenium space that most of us are are used to performing in. Um, I personally, what I shared would not have been um, digestible, I don't think, for an, um, an audience that I'm used to performing for here in Utah, which is maybe, maybe now after doing it in front of people that I um, know can receive it, maybe now I can move forward and into that next step, which I think is really challenging. Uh, but just to say that, yeah, it was, I, I found that um, there was no judgment that could be projected upon anyone sharing in any way because what they were doing and offering um, was so beautiful and honest and true and was so much of their experience. And, and I, just, I just don't see that much here anymore. Um, and I think we, re we received a lot of um, feedback in that way from the audience that like, yeah, this couldn't have happened and that, that they had never seen um, that before here in Utah. Um, so one of our video screenings, um, our fourth video screening was presented on a farm. And so that was a different audience um, who had never really seen capoeira or heard of capoeira and um, what is it? Um, they haven't uh, been exposed to capoeira and as they're watching it, um, they noticed um, some light skinned people because capoeira is developed by um, African slaves who were brought over to Brazil and they noticed some light skinned students in the video and questioned to what point was this culture appropriated and for me hearing that was very complex because i had been thinking about it from the very beginning um you know if this was even right for me to present um uh under this platform uh of pain and possibility and um, you know, presenting a culture that I am just starting to learn. And um, so I talked with my teacher, Master Jamaica, about it briefly. And I, I spoke with um, his wife too, because in my culture, it is respectful if you talk with the woman before the man about concerns or feelings and all of that. So I wanted to approach it in a in a proper way because sometimes the topic is sensitive, um, and I've learned that there are two ways to look at cultural appropriation. There's a negative way, um, which is when a culture is or when which is when culture is being forced upon someone. And the positive way is when it's being shared openly and being offered. And when it's being offered and um, shared in that way, I think that it should be respected. And I think that it should be accepted in, 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 all, in all of its parts. But that is quite tricky to answer so it got me thinking a lot and and it also had me um brought up a discussion for um my uh the the rest of the the group members um involved in the making of this video um to really question you know what is authentic and you know what is real for us and how can we represent a culture that is 
um, that has been a culture and a practice that has been oppressed um, specifically to black people and um, yeah how can the question is, is kind of, it's still kind of something that we are trying to digest as a group because there has there was also another question right after that if we were going to share our video online and in the very beginning i said no because i didn't want to expose our school and expose just like our mastery and i i just felt like very sensitive to all of these parts considering what is happening with black lives matter movement and antifa and and just everything surrounding racial oppression and police brutality so yeah um so so that's uh, a lot of a lot of uh, thoughts have been going through my mind. It's a very complex thought, uh, but I think that if we're looking at it in in a positive way, then culture should be shared. It, like when it when it's shared, it should be respected and it should be honored and accepted. And um, and I felt I felt much better after speaking with my teacher and him saying you know it is a beautiful thing to share you know it is it is good to he he says he always tells us after class or during class you know capoeira is for everyone but not everyone is for capoeira and it sort of represents you know just just that it's like when yeah when culture is shared it should you know, it, it can be taken for um, for its positive parts and um, yeah, sorry, I think I'm going too deep into this, but I hope you all understand. I'll let somebody else talk now. No, that was fabulous. Thank you for working through all that complexity um, and really laying out the challenges here. I think I want to come back to some of that um, in just a minute. I, w I want to ask just to see um, I don't know if Miguel had anything else to say, and also Kathy, I know you were interacting directly with the people using yours and maybe hear your answer to the question. And then, uh, and then maybe we can touch on a question that gets back to some of what Renee was uh, laying out for us. Okay, so um, from, from our experience, um, just painting or getting together in the in the whole process has changed so much you know just from like even going and getting all the materials right going to home depot and you have your face mask on and you're just all you know worried about you know all the stuff that's going on so we were we were also in the process of painting kind of felt that same fear you know even among our our, our collective and everything and uh, we were just really surprised that some of the neighbors still wanted to stop by and have a conversation. And they were asking us questions as to like what, what it meant. And, and they were happy for the, for the hopeful message that we were sending. And um, it, it just really, um, you know, it made us feel really good that that public art has, has that power, right? That, that catalyst to, to, to get to people and to start dialogue, right? From different conversations. So that was kind of like our experience that really touched us. Uh, for our monument, I think um, people were kind of like, in awe of it like like this random monument so we set it up um on the lawn in front of sugar space warehouse and um in the parking lot of a finch lane gallery and yeah both locations were interesting um over by sugar space we had a lot of like car traffic like it'd be people going through the neighborhood and i think some people were intimidated by it because it was like a monument or this like grand arch that they're not used to seeing. 
um, and it was like lit up, things were moving, there are like people around it. So maybe uh, the few that did just come across it were felt intimidated by it. Um, over by the Finch Lane Art Gallery, um, we'd have like some foot traffic from like people uh, around the university and that neighborhood and the park. And yeah, we'd get some people like driving by and be like, whoa, that's so cool. And so interesting, like, audience, I guess. Um, but for those that did come visit it and walk through it, kind of going through this rite of passage, um, I think the value they got out of it was um, afterwards just hanging out and, like, continuing to watch the different animations and, like, seeing it from different angles. And um, I think it was a lot of people's, like, first time hanging out outside in a really long time because of quarantine. So... Um, a lot of human connection, um, having conversations about like current events and catching up with each other. So I think um, our monument kind of connected people in that like you you can see our friends and neighbors again and being hopeful about this future that will continue to happen. Excellent, thank you. So one of the one of the through lines that seems to connect all six of these pieces has to do with addressing this broader context of white supremacy and racism. I think whether we're talking about specifically focused on movements for social change and the Black Lives Matter movement or the question of monuments and what they mean in our society or the dynamics within our own arts community here in Salt Lake City, um, it's one of the things that all of your comments touched on in some way. And so I want to ask, you know, this is a time when a lot of people are talking in a more vocal way and in some new spaces about systemic racism and what it, and, and trying to explore this idea of what it means to disrupt or change or address or, or something. Um, and I, so I'm curious, I would love to hear from you all sort of how you see artists and artistic practice playing a role in that broader conversation or movement. And I ask that, and I think it's interesting because I think you all come at it from very different angles. You have different theories of change as to sort of what, so, and so uh, you can either talk broadly about the arts or base it in your specific project. But how do you see yourself as an artist or artists in general playing a role in this broader context of social change, unrest, and possibility. If everybody's okay, I can go ahead and start. Um, so the one thing I think about is um, a textbook um, that was given to me, a book that it's not traditionally used as a textbook, but in this case it was. And I can put the textbook, all that information in the chat um, in a second. It's all about um, social movements, but this book isn't written in a traditional way. It's 90% pictures and art and 10% words. Almost every single page has art on it. There are beautiful butterflies to represent migration. Um, there are dandelions to represent um, who is seen as a weed um, in the mass um, incarceration, um, the realm of the world. It, encompass, it encompasses all of the major movements of the 21st century here in the United States. That's how I see art. I see art entwined deeply when we think about protest and unrest, civil justice, social justice, political justice. When we look at other parts of the world, I'm from Latin America, and so that's where I'll tend to lean. We see art as this way for political expression to come um, from this underground world in a ways that are safe for people to express their opinions. Um, when it comes to my project Uprising, I'm a community organizer and activist here in Salt Lake. Uh, and so for me, I really dove deeply into this idea that we can't separate. Um, we cannot separate art from politics. 
we think about the propaganda that is shown here in the United States, we think about symbols, the elephant, the donkey, that is art. That is vital and essential to our understanding of elections, of politics, of democracy here in the United States. Those people who created those symbols are artists. At the very basic level of our understanding here in the United States, there is art wherever we look. The people who created our stop signs created art. We use stop signs in so many different ways when it comes to political art. We may put stop Trump outside of the Capitol on a stop sign. That's graffiti. That is using you know, our tools that come in everyday language to create art. Our world is surrounded by art. And this is a way that we can express ourselves safely, unsafely, you know, calmly, disruptive. We can use this powerful tool that we have to create and demand change. I thought that was beautifully put. Thank you. And that was really beautiful, Dulce. Thank you for sharing. And I agree. In, in my vision, I see um, video work being, um, being a way to, to shift perspective, give people a different, um, different, different idea on, on whatever um, information they're receiving from other sources. I think that, that film and video and, and music and dance through capoeira and through community can can really shape the way we think about things. Um, there's so much negativity coming from outside of our communities that can be that can be shifted in order to sort of funnel in the direction that we all need to be going, which is forward. So yeah, I just feel like presenting concepts and ideas to people will allow more space for, for conversation and thoughts and opinions um, that can be addressed in a, in a safe space. So thank you. I would, I would agree. You know, I, I, I've always thought that for me, art has been a form of protest. I mean, I've always been drawing as a kid, but it wasn't until I was 22, 24, where I recognized painting. I'm primarily a painter um, as a way of communicating, as a language that exists in itself, when you don't have the words in writing or in song or sculpture, or any of that, there is, there's art and it's its own language. Um, <clears throat> so it's always been a form of protest for me. It's how I get out a lot of my frustrations that I see in the world. Um, it's how I make sense of a lot of the things. And for me, I feel like rather than propaganda where you are preaching to the choir art poses a question rather than answer something that nobody asks you know something that something that somebody that wasn't in your circle of friends would agree with so i think it's more valuable to pose questions and let let the viewer come to a conclusion than it is to yell in a vacuum. And I think that is the power of art. 
Um, and that's why I continue to do it. I know art has changed me. I've seen it change other people. And I'm excited for it to continue to change me and see what happens with it. Perfect, thank you. Dominica, were you gonna say something? I was just quickly going to say, um, uh, specifically relating to uh, dance and contemporary dance um, and um, codified dance forms that are taught in institutions. Uh, so mainly like um, forms derived from or thought to be derived from Eastern Europeans. Um, I would love to see firstly um, ballet no longer um, said to be the basis of all dance. I think that's one step. And then um, I would like to see the removal of uh, binaries either or white supremacist thinking, right or wrong. That is just such a fundamental of ballet. But um, so then maybe as a result um, of all, a lot of the other dance forms that we're, of dance in general, in, in my career, in, in my experience, and on the trajectory that I have gone on with um, more classical, um, um, dance forms and so um, it's super harmful and limiting um, to work in for, for a mindset to be is this the right way to dance is this the wrong way to dance and I think if we can move away from that which we absolutely have to uh, um, if we can begin to dismantle that um, dance as an art form can can progress in a in a more 360 degree way. Thank you so much. I um, yeah, those were four very different, very powerful answers of sort of different pieces of this, this larger issue. We wanna continue this question of sort of what is needed, what's necessary, what did we learn from this and what's next? And, but we wanna move into small groups so that all everyone can have a little more chance to talk uh, as well. So, um, Maggie puts us into to some small groups. I'm just gonna go over, we have some community agreements. These are obviously very important questions and all important questions that, we're, that we wrestle with um, can bring up um, difficult conversations and so uh, difficult and important conversations. So we have some community agreements from UMFA. I'm just gonna go through them real quickly that we ask you to abide by in these conversations. So the first one is to ensure all voices are heard by actively listening and respecting differences in opinion to use I statements. Remember, you cannot speak for others, only your own experiences and opinions. Don't assume everyone has the same beliefs and understanding as yourself. Address the issue, not the person. Do not personally attack someone. Embrace honesty and compassion. Struggle to deepen understanding and unity. Participate with unpopular viewpoints. Take responsibility for your feelings and actions. Stay present and stay curious. Bring the self to the space that believes in possibility. Take care of yourself and your needs, permission to eat and move your body. Lean into discomfort and accept non-closure. And that's an important one with these acne sessions because this is about catalyzing and starting conversations, but by no means by 7.45 do we complete them. So thank you all for that. And we will move into our small groups. Um, well, that, that part went by really fast. I hope you all had a chance to at least connect with your fellow humans and uh, get to know each other a little bit. Uh, a, a big part of ACME sessions are about uh, meeting people and connecting and sharing ideas and uh, hopefully continuing the conversation and, uh, and finding opportunities to collaborate and to share and to support each other. So uh, amazingly, we're like right on time. And, um, and I just, uh, again, just wanna thank you all for, uh, for, for sharing. Um, if, if it's all right with you, I think I'll just get the, the share back, the talk back going where I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to share some of the, um, some of the ideas that were shared in, in, in our little group. Um, and then, uh, another one of the facilitators can go next. Um, so we didn't, we didn't really like necessarily address so much the, the question, what is needed or what is necessary, but we just, we, but we did answer those questions by talking about what this work meant to us and, and, and why it was important. And um, so there was a, a major celebration in this project as far as like the range of work. 
um, and range of expression. Um, there was talk about how we depend on art for our, our survival on the planet and in order to get through this pain collectively. Um, there was a request if for a second part of this project. So all you organizers out there, let's see, let's see part two. Um, also uh, a request to engage uh, younger creators. So high school or even younger, and also to maybe provide opportunities for mentorship, uh, which I thought was a brilliant idea. Um, there was so much richness and creativity in this work. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to, to get to know who made something and what their intention and process was. So these sessions allow us to connect to the work and the project in, in different ways and kind of understand sort of some of the behind the scenes and some of the thoughts. We don't always get to know what the artist is thinking. So uh, there was a celebration of that. Um, um, we also talked about how for people that are not from Utah, um, you know, like what a culture shock it is to come to Utah uh, from a diverse place um, and how, uh, how one can really feel lonely and uh, unsupported here um, and how projects like this um, are ways for us to channel anger and pain um, through art and through creative expression. Um, and this idea that community support um, heals uh, and is extremely important. Um, also this idea about taking care of our bodies and our minds um, as a way to, uh, um, to be present in the world, but also as a form of resistance. Um, we need more calls and opportunities like this. Um, um, and like this project to showcase uh, not only the diversity of our community, but also how supportive and encouraging our community can be of each other and with each other. Um, um, and also how this work can, you know, really gives us a sense of hope and possibility in, in some dark times. Um, there was also talk about how art and design is a way to communicate complex ideas. Um, but also there's this amazing tool for self-discovery, um, for discovering our own identities, um, and that making work like this and observing work like this can, can generate a broader sense of identity, um, personally and within the world. Um, and that it's so important to question and challenge monuments um, and to create our own monuments. Um, keep making this work, keep sharing this work. Um, just because we have to self-isolate doesn't mean that we can't make performative and participatory work. You have all shown that. Um, it's possible. And um, so please keep doing it. Stay creative and stay radical. That's, that's, what, that's what I got for our group. Should I call on someone? Is that, should we do it that way? Um, Dulce. Hi, yeah, I just quickly wanna to touch on the point um, about the high schoolers. Um, my project actually only featured um, high schoolers, or I'm post-grad now. Um, I'm a first year in college, and the other two artists are a sophomore and a senior, respectively, in high school. Um, we were the youngest group um, to receive this um, opportunity in this space. So definitely, if you're interested, please reach out to me after, and I would be glad to talk about more involvement for high schoolers and younger students. Um, my group really touched on um, the medical and um, our intersection that we can create. Um, what, um, you know, how do we create new intersections within um, medical practices? Um, we have multiple people in our group 
who worked in that intersection and are trying to make that intersection bigger, broader, more beautiful, more noticeable. Um, and, you know, we wanted to brainstorm some ideas. How do we make hospitals feel more welcoming? Um, how do we engage with healthcare workers um, and art? What opportunities are there um, for healthcare workers to really physically engage in arts? Um, are, you know, sessions like this provide great opportunities um, for healthcare workers to really deeply dive into a conversation of art and to see where it will fit into their own work. Um, we also touched on public spaces, art in public spaces. What does that look like? How does that feel and how has that changed now that we're living in a pandemic um, and physical contact is no longer socially accepted? Um, how can we make public art and still involve a community? What change did that look like for artists? Um, you know, how does that feel for an artist whose work is solely, um, you know, created for communities and engages in the artistic process with community members? Um, those were some of the big takeaways from our conversation. Should I popcorn or do you want a popcorn? Okay. I will go ahead and popcorn to Brittany. Thank you. So um, I am going to actually let Claire. Um, she took some wonderful notes and was very detailed. So I'm going to let Claire share. If you're okay with that, Claire, she she told me privately she was fine with that. So here here she goes talking about what we uh, discussed in our group. Um, yep, I, I took notes on uh, Brittany's behalf. So in our group, um, we sort of talked about what's next and where we go from here. Um, and um, how did all of this start? Um, and somebody pointed out that we've sort of had a quick move away from being aware of systemic racism. Like a lot of people were maybe not even aware of it and all of a sudden became aware of it and people jumped from this new awareness to try to act on it. And maybe what was missing, a step missing in there um, was reflection and analysis of how we've built these structures and um, this series, Pain and Possibility, sort of allowed space for reflection and analysis. And maybe we could even have more of that. Um, someone was concerned about, you know, everyone addressing racism is maybe a trend and it definitely is a trend. Um, and there was a hope that we'd move away from it just being a trend and move into more accountability and accountability on so many levels of, you know, different forms of oppression um, and recognizing where you're wrong and where you might have privilege and where you might be oppressing others. Um, and to not be as scared to recognize and to take accountability and to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, this uh, this uh, whole you know uh, situation has also led a lot of white people to start talking about the ways that they've messed up and the ways that they have been racist um, and fed into systemic racism and um, um, white supremacy. Um, we talked about how much power art has and how it can impact you in a special way. Um, that other forms of uh, social conduct don't necessarily affect you in the same way. Um, and how can we use art to educate ourselves and educate others? Um, we'd also like for the discussion about uh, racism in uh, art organizations and how this racism can be addressed and removed. Um, and also, you know, we talked about being conscious of your privilege, your place of privilege as a leader in an art organization um, and deciding who gets the funding for these kinds of projects um, and the difficulty in getting the word out. And um, to counteract that, you know, the idea is to just involve as many organizations and people as possible to get as many voices involved as possible. Um, and then sort of the ending questions we had was how do we make it sustainable and equitable um, you know, how do we continue to question the status quo? Um, and um, I guess, you know, basically to continue to reach out and connect um, and that's already empowering. This forum is already empowering and uplifting that we're reaching out and connecting um, and continuing to get out of our comfort level and connecting with our community. That's everything, thanks. 
Thank you so much for sharing that wonderful notes. Dominique, I can close us out. Um, okay, so everything that everyone just shared was amazing. Um, thank you. Um, we, ours was, we were pretty conversational, just talking about um, the project. One thing that came up uh, that is uh, something that Courtney and I really were thinking about and in, in thinking about doing a project outside of a proscenium space anyway is uh, utilizing um, these like um, underutilized spaces, really spaces that weren't made for dance specifically, um, or maybe even for art specifically, and how can we um, um, like move into them. Um, um, some Mario said something that was really wonderful, which is that um, what, what Courtney and I were doing specifically I feel bad because so much of what y'all said is like on the broader scale and we were sort of talking about the shedding. So I'm sorry, but um, was that we were um, humanizing, our, our approach was to humanize the artists that we were working with. And I hadn't thought of it that way, but that was, um, that just like uh, really pulled it in for me. And it's true. And I mean, I think I think all of us who, who, who made work on in this platform were doing that. Um, and, um, we talked a little bit about like sustainability and, and um, how that's going to be possible for uh, for the arts, but dance especially. And I spoke about um, a way that we raised money for this, which was through the form of a morality registry, which was essentially us saying, um, we're um, asking you for money uh, and you should give us your money, um, not artists, uh, people out, like, especially not dance artists, we already know what position you're in uh, and how hard you work for the money that you have. But um, basically we do so much for free already. We do so much for less than um, what we're worth, um, uh, for less than it is worth that we're asking you to help fund this project uh, for nothing in return other than a little bit of a morality boost is what we said. And we provided this registry so you could, um, um, sustain a uh, dance artist by help um, give, offering them the time to water their plants instead of maybe send an email or actually cook themselves dinner for once. <laughs> yeah, Kate showing her certificate. <laughs> um, yeah, we get, we handed out some at the actual event to people who donated and then we're, we're mailing the others. Uh, but this was our way of saying um, we already, we already like stretch ourselves so thin. Um, you say you want to support the arts, so here's your opportunity. And, um, but how sustainable that is when Courtney and I reached out to friends and family who reached out to friends and family, how can we receive the same amount of support without doing that is um, all of us is a, is a bigger conversation, but yeah. Thank you, Dom, and, and thank you to everyone that uh, participated in this community dialogue and this conversation. Um, I'm gonna take us home, as they say. Uh, it's eight o'clock. Uh, we've been together for about an hour and a half. I gotta say, there's something very uh, democratic about everyone having a little grid and just, you know, there's, we're all equal ground here. We're all contributing to this conversation. We're all learning from each other. Um, and so um, thank you for, for making time. Many of you are probably, this is probably your sixth Zoom call today. So the fact that you've actually uh, made some time to, to, to come together is incredibly meaningful to all of us. I just wanted to, just to close out, I just wanna say thank you to all of the artists for all that you do. Uh, so important uh, what you do. Please keep doing it and please uh, keep challenging us to support you better. Um, I want to thank uh, our wonderful uh, uh, facilitators, uh, Paul Kuttner and, um, and Brittany Reese, just amazing, amazing humans in our community. Uh, huge shout out to Mika, Mestizo Institute of Culture and Arts, Sugar Space Arts Warehouse. Of course, we want to thank our partner, the Salt Lake City Public Library. Uh, we want to thank ZAP, we want to thank the Salt Lake City Arts Council, and of course, we would not all be here if the Utah Museum of Fine Arts and ACME didn't bring us all together. So, um, and these things mean nothing without all of you. So please, when we send you our survey, um, let us know what your thoughts are. It'll only take like five minutes. You might win a free pass to the museum. 
and uh, just um, please uh, take care of yourselves, be well, stay safe, and keep being awesome. Much love.